Today we look at steam-powered trains with nostalgia, representing a slower, simpler time. But trains were cutting-edge technology in their day. The railroads were all vying for that competitive edge to better move freight and people. For passengers, trains were a miraculous leap forward in speed and comfort of travel. As railroads moved across the Wild West, journeys that took months in wagons or that jarred every bone in a person's skeleton now took days on a fairly smooth road of steel rails. River crossings now took minutes instead of hours, and passengers could actually gaze at the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans in the same week. In the days of such blazing progress, it's doubtful that many passengers would complain about the hard wooden seat they might occupy until they'd actually had to ride in one for many hours or several days. The padded seat you see here would have been a huge step up from the coaches of the trains back then. With multi-day journeys now within reach of those with means, demand for greater comfort was emerging in the United States. That demand was heard loud and clear by this man, George Pullman. Pullman believed that people would pay extra to take their journey in comfort so we set up a company that built high-quality coaches and sleeping cars. Rather than selling the cars to railroads, Pullman leased the cars by contract. Railroads that wanted the image of quality and quality service were eager to sign on with Pullman. Pullman cars were a hit with the public. Passengers at first would buy their ticket from a railroad agent for transportation, then buy a separate ticket to be in a Pullman car on the same train. Traveling Pullman meant traveling in style. But it wasn't just the cars that made passengers eager to reach into their pockets. It was the service. George Pullman didn't leave that critical component to the railroads. He leased his cars with service personnel included. He called these workers, critical to the success of his business, porters. The year 1870 was just five years after the Civil War, and George Pullman recruited former slaves to be his service staff. Pullman especially valued former house slaves, those with experience in serving white people. Pullman provided a rare opportunity for these former slaves to make a decent living and to begin to build some small amount of wealth for their families. That's not to say there was a free ride. Pullman porters worked long hours, often days at a time with little sleep, lots of time away from home, the work was physically taxing, and they had a very severe code of conduct. Pullman demanded excellent service to passengers, but he also wanted his porters to blend into the background while the service of Pullman porters was valued. They were expected to almost be invisible. Information for this video clip comes from an outstanding book entitled Rising from the Rails by Larry Tye. I'll continue relating what I learned from it, but to get the whole story, I highly recommend getting and reading this book. Another book about Pullman Porters is The Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters by Robert L. Allen. I haven't read it. While George Pullman's business model was a roaring success with the public, there was trouble in the company town of Pullman, Illinois. Pullman had a utopian vision, all his workers living alcohol-free in good houses rented from him by his workers. This worked fine until the financial crisis of 1893, a depression only 20 years after the Panic of 1873. Pullman's business empire felt the pain. His response, reduce workers' pay. When a worker's envoy asked that he in turn reduce the rent, he refused. And thus began the Pullman strike of 1894. George Pullman's refusal to even submit to third-party arbitration left his workers little recourse. 
They were struggling to feed their families while Pullman dined in his mansion. The strike spread to rail yards across the country where American Rail Worker Union members refused to handle Pullman cars and stopped rail traffic. When riots broke out, federal troops were brought in. Before it was over, 30 striking workers were killed and the short-lived union dissolved. Pullman porters were not involved in the Pullman strike. Passengers continued flocking to Pullman cars and enjoying the amenities and the stellar service. Passengers didn't realize that, in a sense, they were teachers, showing members of this isolated race how wealthy Americans lived. Some Pullman porters took every opportunity to learn and share this knowledge with their communities. They formed their own union, secretly at first, and struggled for more equitable pay and better working conditions. It was called the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. It was the first such effort to represent African American workers. That modeling and countless other acts were early manifestations of the Civil Rights Movement. The long journey of the Pullman Porters leaves its mark on America even today. Read all about it in Rising from the Rails, published by Holton Company Press.